Mr. President, thank you so much for your commitment to this movement. Uh, you really helped start the movement because if it wasn't for your support, I don't know if we could have created this network of cooperation. And last time you were here, um, you said to me, Joe, the growth's been amazing. If you can get to a couple of thousand, you guys are going to, in front of the audience, you guys are going to grow like wildfire. And as we were leaving, you said to me that if you can get to a few thousand, I'm going to put my medium mic behind this thing. Well, he made this commitment at a CGI <laughs> meeting, so I'm sort of obligated to flack for you guys. <laughs> so we want to brag. We want to brag through you. So are you ready to do true, true to that commitment? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just today, we heard commitments from several people, um, HQI representing 400 hospitals in California, that they're going to, they're making a commitment to reduce preventable death through three initiatives by about 15,000. So if we have a good chance by next year, this time, and it's, the year just has begun, to hopefully go from 500 hospitals to several thousand hospitals and hopefully 60,000 lives, like you said. Well, you know, I, I, I believe that all over the country, the deaths from hospital incurred infections are going to go down dramatically because more and more people are just going to do what they need to do. And it's pretty basic and it's hard to justify not doing it. And I think the, uh, there are other things that are more complex. And sepsis itself is a complicated thing because not everybody who dies of sepsis was infected in the hospital. Maybe they were just misdiagnosed or mistreated, but I'm glad you're focusing on that as well as the other areas that you're focusing on. And I think I mentioned uh, when I started this idea of the avoidable deaths from prescription drug overdoses, but it's a, it's a huge problem now. And it's a, uh, it's going to be complicated by illegal drugs, too, because the market for illegal Mexican and other marijuana is dropping dramatically as the decriminalization movement takes hold. But the narco traffickers have decided that they're going to try to double up on heroin and flood the United States with it and try to make as many addicts as possible. So we're going to have to be alive to this and realize that we can save a lot of these people's lives if we know what we're doing, we know how to do it. As you've shown, and we've borrowed uh, heavily with your permission as part of the Clinton Global Initiative commitment we made to you to create this commitment-based movement, instead of people just showing up to a meeting, they only get to show up if they've made a commitment, just like you, you pioneered. We're ready to do it on our own, but what role do you think the government can have in assuring that we get to zero by 2020? Well, I think, first of all, you need to, they need to have a set of incentives that dramatically increase the rate at which you get more and more people involved in this. And then they need to, insofar as they can, meet the supply shortages that will otherwise keep you from doing some things. We talked about this a little bit and uh, with all these new bacteria coming up and the drug companies having a very hard time justifying spending the amount of money they have to spend to figure out what would be effective when it appears that the numbers of people who needed to stay alive are relatively small. So the government, I think, has, uh, has to get with the drug companies and get with all the other providers and figure out in the next 10 years, starting today, but projecting out the next 10 years, what are the big challenges that will not be met absent appropriate investment? And we know that it's one of the things that there historically has been a very high level of bipartisan support for is 
biomedical research and other forms of investment. Not so much for coverage expansion, not so much for uh, the alternative ways of administering healthcare to lower the cost, but that'll come too. The, the, the results in the end will overwhelm the rhetoric. And this healthcare bill still got some problems, but it's done way more good than harm in my opinion. And we just have to keep working on it, making it better and identifying what still needs to be done. And I think that I, I think um, I was just talking to Jim Messina in the audience about the incredible reaction that ordinary voters had to the president's announcement in the State of the Union address to this Precision Medicine Initiative, and how a lot of the people who think they're sort of political mavens were somewhat surprised by that. It doesn't surprise me. That, I mean, after all, it is our life. <laughs> You know, but unless you are a devout Hindu, this is not a dress rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, and I'm not being disrespectful to the Hindus. The older I get, the more I like it, actually. <laughs> the idea that I may become one, but I, but I, we're laughing. But I like for people to laugh because when you laugh, it makes space for you to think. When you're mad, you can't think to save your life. You ever notice that? And so I, I think that the next big step is you, you need an arm of this movement devoted to analyzing and being precise about what you think the federal government needs to do, what their role would be, and then going and asking them to assume it. And you should assume, I believe, that you can get support in both parties for it. Because I, I remember when we got, uh, when Newt Gingrich and those guys won the Congress from the pre Tea Party, Tea Party Congress, the head of the National Institute of Health, Harold, Harold Baumas, was a Nobel Prize winning scientist and a marvelous man. But he was really shrewd too. So, he brought all the new members of Congress out to the NIH and laid them in a hospital bed and showed them the presentation because everybody wants to live forever. And we know, thanks to a lot of comparative research, that the average human body is built to last slightly more than 100 years. So all of us who don't make it to 100 unless we end our lives in an accident, a crime, a natural disaster, or we suffer from an environmentally caused cancer, otherwise we play some role in our own demise. And we want to do better. So I think you can get a lot of support if you, uh, if you do it. And so I, I think you do need, some part of this group needs to be constantly, every you know, few months, refining what the federal agenda is. And you're, you're smart enough to know that they can't do everything. We still got to deal with this debt problem and there are competing concerns uh, from security to education to the most immediate one now. It's how to get family incomes up again. And uh, they seem to be rising a little bit because so many new jobs have been created, but we still haven't gotten median income back to where it was the day I left office. So that's a big deal. You can't have a a country where all the gains go to people in the top 1%. It kills capitalism. It's capitalism devouring itself. That's why you, you, I'm tired of reading the New York press every day about billionaires and their trades. I want to read about billionaires and their investments. Big difference. And if you think that there's no investment to be made, like in healthcare, then you just trade. You try to invest in something, hold it for a year and a day so you can get your capital gains right and sell it, even if the consequences are quite bad for the economy, or at least at most are totally neutral to the welfare of average people. That's one of the things that's good about this. You know, anything that holds down healthcare costs will raise wages because 
employers, particularly the smaller ones who don't have a lot of extra money, have been almost blocked from wage increases for decades when we were raising health care costs at three and four times the rate of inflation. And I gave you that example that if these rates go through as planned in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas, then our state, which has the per capita income lower than theirs, will see a relative rise compared to them because employers will have more disposable income to put into pay raises as opposed to health care. We were invited to testify at a Senate hearing uh, regarding patient safety. In that hearing, we recommended three items that the government could do to help us get to zero. One was transparency. You know, for the financial system where there's less at stake, as a public company, we have to, all of us, whether we make toys, guns, or medical technology, or drugs, we have to show the same data about our financials. So we thought, why not hospitals show what's causing harm and why? Second idea we had is aligned incentives. Right now, if you take your car in for a tune-up, and next thing you go back to pick it up and it's caught on fire, they don't charge you for the tune-up. They give you a new car, probably. But if someone goes into the hospital for a hip implant and they die from, the hip implant goes well, but they die from whether it's hospital-acquired infection, medication, or whatever it might be, Medicare and the insurers still get billed for that hip implant. So if we said, if someone gets harm from a preventable cause and the hospital didn't have a plan in place to prevent it, then maybe it shouldn't get reimbursed. And by that action, the hospital CEOs will see the incentive in implementing those. And of course, what are, what are your thoughts on those two? Well, first, I think that's a good idea. I, you know, I, I have a, I, I, let me just back up and tell you kind of what my bias is. I saw my first surgery when I was 12 years old and it was a bloody mess and I didn't get sick. I was the first father ever allowed in a delivery room in the Arkansas Baptist Hospital for a cesarean section. I've always been fascinated by all this. And here's what I know. Good people, no matter how careful they are, will occasionally make mistakes. So there will never be a perfect world. What you want to know is that the people running the show do everything they can in forms of preventive measures and there needs to be there are standards for a lot of that I think I think if you did that and they, and they didn't have the appropriate uh, remediative action ready to go then I think not reimbursing or certainly not reimbursing fully would be appropriate the other thing is on the on the data in general I think transparency is good for one thing, if you're not transparent, people are convinced you're hiding something really bad. <laughs> you know, we're, we're all sort of suspicious of that now. We're living in an age when we ought to have that. Uh, Pennsylvania was the first state to regularly have hospitals publish the results of a whole variety of procedures and what they cost by hospitals. And every year, the conclusion is the same, which is that there's no connection between cost and result. The result is determined by how many of procedure X the hospital does, and the more they do, the better they get at it. But it's really helpful. And I, you know, I think that greater transparency would be good. The, the, the federal agency in charge of these things and running overseeing Medi Medicaid and Medicare, tried to do some of that this last year. But we're just scratching the surface. Nobody should be afraid of that. People can understand, for example, if you treat more sick people, more poor people, more diabetics than everybody else, they, they, you know, maybe your results won't be as good. But there's no point in hiding whatever the facts turn out to be, particularly if, let's say, the patient's advocates are on the forefront saying, look, we're trying to make this better. And if these people are willing to be honest with us, we have to be willing to work with them. We're all going to do this together, but we got to know. If we don't know, how are we going to fix it? So I think the transparency issue 
is the one that needs to be pushed because we still don't have anything like what we need. I also believe that there's not enough actionable data that comes to individual patients or potential patients from a lot of these healthcare websites. That I think they're doing a great job for people like my daughter. I who grew up in the computer age and you know used to call me when I was she was in Stanford and I was still in the White House and it was three hours earlier there. So she'd read the New York Times and the Washington Post and Wall Street Journal over the internet every night about midnight and call me and <laughs> not at midnight. She she'd read it about ten thirty, so it'd be about one thirty and she'd call and she goes I, she called me one night and I said, you're calling me awful late. She said, you're up, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yeah. She said, I know how you work. And we talk about it. That, that there's a whole generation of people who are well-educated and comfortable for whom the language of these health apps is easy. But I think, I read an article the other day, I'm embarrassed, I can't remember the name of the author, but he was from some uh, from Westport and uh, at a, one of these creativity hubs and he said, it's fine, but what if you're a coal miner in Kentucky? How do you, we need to tell stories and, and trigger the emotions and get people to use these things. There's enough information now available to people that they could begin wherever they are to improve their own health if they could connect to it very well. So. That's the third thing. In addition to transparency, you need information available in a form that people can understand. Uh, you know, there's massive studies about how all of our brains work and when we're rational and when we're not. And what makes you listen and what makes you not. And I think that a lot of attention should be given in this whole patient protection thing, particularly if you want to empower the patients how to communicate to people in a way that they will understand it, with stories as well as just facts. I like the facts. I like the argument, the rational argument, how to get from A to B to C. But I have long since given up thinking that that's the only way people communicate. It's like when this whole deal's over today, I'll be lucky if you remember three points I made. And we know that communication is only about 20 to 25 percent the words that you utter. A lot of it's your tone of voice and your gestures and how people feel when you're talking to them. All that needs to be integrated into this patient's empowerment movement so that you have the maximum number of people being able to use all these great apps that these young, brilliant people in Silicon Valley and elsewhere are developing so they can all use it. Now, in places where we're just starting, there's a young man in the audience who told me he came to the Clinton Global Initiative for University Students a few years ago and he won a $5,000 grant and now he's got a $3.5 million operation in Nepal. And a lot of places where we work trying to build out health systems, we're beaming stuff out to the healthcare providers and we don't have to worry so much about the language. We know they'll get it and they'll use it and we get a very high efficiency for the efforts we make. But when you're talking about empowering patients all over America, you need to speak to them in a language that they can relate to over the internet, same as you would if you were having a cup of coffee with them. And I don't think we've given enough thought to that yet. Mr. President, one of the things, speaking of data, that we set out to do is to create this patient data superhighway so that when you or I are in the hospital, not only our prior record, but the data from lab, the data from imaging, the data from the vital signs machines are all going to some type of a predictive algorithm that can help the clinicians know which direction you're going and maybe even why. We're, we're fortunate that today over 50 medical technology companies have made the pledge to share their data towards that goal. Companies like Draeger, GE, Cerner, of course Massimo, 
But many other companies are resisting it. And without the full picture, without all the data, it's like filling out an elephant and we're all 11 blind men. Three of us really don't know what we're touching. It's collectively, we can figure out that it's the elephant. So what can we do to get the rest of them to join in? Uh, what, what, is, what, is, what is some of your thoughts and suggestions? Well, I think, first of all, we have to say that, that any relative commercial advantage you get from not sharing the data is going to be short-lived because this train is going to run over you. You, you got to just realize people, if we want to live as well and as long as we can, which I think is our moral obligation as well as our personal desire, you got to be able to have electronic medical records that mean something, and that means everybody's got to kick in. Secondly, I think that we have to be able to make as many assurances as we can that the privacy of those records will be protected and will be available only to the patient and to the healthcare provider at the moment, wherever the patient is. But, you know, we've come a long way from, I remember when Hillary was a senator, she and the Republican senator from Tennessee, Bill Frist, who's a doctor and a really fine man, worked together to try to get the beginnings of this electronic medical records movement going. We're way beyond where we were then, but there are still people who just don't believe in it, and it's just a mistake. I mean, it's, it's, it's the difference in life and death for people, and you can't, you know, particularly for older people, and, and the fastest growing group of Americans are over 80, you know, if they're taking all these different potentially conflicting medicines, the, the medicine for an emergency treatment is likely to have a terrible adverse reaction to something they're taking for their diabetes. People need to know all that, and they need to know it right now, not two hours or five hours or tomorrow morning. So I think, I believe that we need to get all the reluctance partners, partners in the room and find out what they're really concerned about. And if they're really worried about people raiding their records and getting some commercial advantage, we need to just have say, look, we're gonna maximize the privacy of these records. We're gonna maximize their limited availability only to the patients themselves or the people treating them. But you don't want to stand in the way of a movement that could save untold numbers of lives just because people know you'll look crazy. Why are you doing, why are you in this business? The first place to save lives. Yeah, incidentally, you make money, but you're in it to save lives. So if you're in it to save lives, you can't have a position which you know will cost lives. And I think in the end, when there are other people in that same business who are willing to share, the, the, it'll go away. But we, we need to show a fix. You know, uh, there are a lot of movements, including in Southern California, to put the, all the medical records of lower income people into the cloud securely and then make them available because of this Medicaid expansion so that many of them will have dramatically better care than they've ever had before. And there again, there's some people say, I don't know, but I believe it's gonna happen. And I think the best way to do it is to get them all in the room with people who do what they do and disagree with them. And look, we can all make money doing the right things. I remember when, a um, long time ago, when the generic AIDS medicine was $500 a person a year, and it was already a high profit margin, low volume business, and uncertain payment. There was no PEPFAR, there was no global fund on AIDS, TB, malaria, and I got a couple of countries to agree to give me 20 million bucks a year each for five years, which was all the money in the world back then, 12 years ago. To, and I let them pick the countries, and I said, I don't want to touch this money, just don't release it until I let it go. And we went to the Indian manufacturers, and one in South Africa, and we said, you're running a foolish business model here. We want you to cut your prices and dramatically increase your volume. I'll pay you on time, and I'll bring in the best experts in the world on supply chain, 
and manufacturing. And if you don't make more money, I'll rewrite the contract. And I was newly out of office and I had good relationships with both countries and they trusted me. But they all made a lot more money by treating more people at lower cost. I think that's going to happen. I think you're going to see that. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen on this medical device tax fight in Washington, but I know one thing. Let's assume nothing happens. Within five years, everybody will be making more money because more people will be able to have access to devices like the one you send me the latest update on all the time. My numbers are still pretty good. <laughs> Happy to hear that. <laughs> Mr. President, last question. Um, First of all, no matter how often you come here, it's inspiring to us. You're the first husband always. But I used to joke, I gave a speech that bombed at the Democratic Convention in Atlanta in 1988. We were walking out of the Omni Arena and I used to tell people, I said, Hillary was running up to total strangers saying, have you met my first husband? <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't really do it. She didn't want to see me cry. <laughs> so, go ahead. so why do you keep coming back to our meeting? I know how in demand you are, how busy you are. Well, look, I, first, this is extraordinary. And you did me the honor of announcing the kickoff at the Clinton Global Initiative. But I hope, I meant what I said to you, I hope that what you're doing here, A, will succeed, and B, will change the model of decision-making in America across a whole range of other things. I'm telling you folks, the only thing that works anywhere in the world is when you get people together across the lines that otherwise divide them, and they agree on a common goal, then they argue like crazy over how to get there with the view to making an ultimate decision and getting a show on the road. That's the only thing that works. Now, it may not be good press because there's no blood on the floor, and sometimes constant conflict wins elections, but it doesn't get anything done. The, the one reason I like Senator Klobuchar, I don't want to embarrass her, is that she's in Minnesota, which is a highly communitarian state, not necessarily a liberal state, a communitarian state, where people believe that we can only fulfill our personal dreams and our family's destinies if we work together. And she embodies that. That's actually what works. And so I keep coming back here because it's thrilling to see what you're doing and because I hope I can get you a little more publicity and then people who may be interested in something entirely different will go after that something in the same way that you have. You have no, look, I'm just telling you, if you look at the United States today, there is not a country in the world better positioned for the 21st century that handles all of our religious and other diversity better, that with all of our problems, we're too unequal now, we gotta do something about that. We gotta restore equal opportunity and have broad-based prosperity. People have to be rewarded for their work. But we are well positioned and What's killing us is we're not doing what we know we ought to do because in order to get that done, people would have to be willing to work together who are otherwise disinclined to do so. So I figure since everybody wants to live to be 100 and have their wits about them when they do, we're making progress, thank God, on Alzheimer's too. If I come here partly because I just want people to see this and think, well, hell, why aren't we doing this on everything? And you should ask yourself that, too, when you go home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.